Tonight's topic will be a continuation of last week when, when Colin was covering iterations and the per package and so on. And so we will uh, just turn it back over to him, let him pick up where we left off and, and off we go. Uh, excellent. So uh, like Ryan said, um, we'll kind of finish, I think we'll finish chapter 21 iteration tonight, uh, depending on how much discussion we have. Um, we'll mostly kind of work on work through like the per package and some of the per functions that are available. And then we'll go through a bunch of examples that I've kind of put together. Uh, I've, I've been trying to not take the examples from the book as much and try and create some examples, trying to apply some more things that I find practical that I've used some of these functions for. So um, hopefully they make sense. Um, hopefully they're giving you a little heads up. When we get to PMAP, I think I'll, that one's kind of, that one's, I don't really get that one just yet. But anyways, uh, let me share my screen here real quick. So desktop two, so everybody can see my slides, correct? Okay, great. Um, so what we're going to talk about is we'll finish chapter 21 tonight. But before we do that, we have a little bit of time. Easy question for a five minute icebreaker. Uh, where I live, the seasons don't know if it necessarily wants to become summer or remain spring. So it made me prompt this question. What season would you be if you could choose? No, I can go first. I live in a place when we have just two seasons, you know, winter and winter. <laughs> but anyway, if I could, I, I would be fall because, you know, the color. Very nice. Excellent. Anybody else? What season would you be? I would be summer. Summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I am not very cold resistant at all, like at all. And I live in a cold city because Kiryu is up in the mountains, in the mountains, but like up, up, up. There's a snow in the equator. <laughs> Picture that, you know? <laughs> so, and still, I'm like, my mom, since I was little, used to always say that I should have been born at the beach, you know, in the coast. Yeah. <laughs> So is it is it turning into summer? Like I, I can't I can't remember how the hemispheres work and stuff. Is it turning into summer in Ecuador? In a way. So we only have two seasons. So it's like the rainy season and the dry season. But the the, temp, the weather is always in a range that is way shorter than what you would experience. The variation that you would have in the seasons that you have. So it's only rainy and dry. And the difference is not so much in the temperature, but in how much it rains versus not. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Who else? I would, I would pick spring because I don't really like it too hot or too cold. And it's, it's interesting in Houston because it's hot from like April till November. But this past February, we actually got snow, which never happens. And it's crazy when you're sitting out in the snow, you're thinking at some point, I'm not going to be able to stand out here because I'm going to just sweat. It's like, how can it be this cold right now? And in a few months, it will be super hot. <laughs> but I would, I would prefer spring overall. Excellent. Sky, what about you? Me, I, I think, you know, I, I think in, in Southern California is always very shiny, even if it's in the winter. But I think in the winter, it's very different from like the rest of the seasons. Um, here in the season, I here in the winter, I like it the uh, I like it the most because because the mountains on the top of the mountains is always be like spread with a lot of ice and the snow, and it looks gorgeous. But in but then and uh, but then in our like uh, in the cities, we can still go swimming, go to the beach. So it looks, it just feels very special in here in, in the winter. So I really like it here in the winter. <laughs> That's excellent. That's great. Many of you live in like some really nice places. I, I live in a place where it's just very Midwest, small town kind of, kind of area. So, um, we don't have those kind of separations where you can go up into the mountains and come back. So that must be nice. Uh, I would probably say fall for myself, um, mainly because I like the crisp, like the cool crispness, but I still like the heat during the day. So I would say fall for me. So excellent. 
Uh, so, like Ryan said, tonight our kind of goal – oh, some quick housekeeping reminders. Uh, you can kind of review these. I'm not going to spend too much time on these because we've been together for almost 24 weeks now, so I don't need to reiterate these. But I think the most important one that I do want to highlight again is – if we need to slow down, you know, just let me know if I miss something or we want to discuss something in further, you know, don't be afraid to interrupt me. I'm more than happy to, you know, walk through something or answer a question. So most likely if you have that question, someone else probably has that question as well. So don't be afraid to ask it. Uh, the rest of them you can kind of read on your own. But um, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to finish chapter 21. We'll pick up where we left off talking about the per, per functions. Then we'll talk about dealing with failure. So using adverbs like safely, possibly, uh, to, to, uh, pick up, to uh, pick up failures within our iteration. We'll talk about mapping over multiple arguments where we'll talk about map two, and then we'll talk about PMAP. Then we'll talk a little bit about per walk, and then we'll wrap up with some other patterns of for loops. So talk about some other things that are available to us through the use of predicate functions and, and, and the like. So to kind of pick up where we left off last time with the per package, uh, we talked about what the per package was. We talked about the difference between imperative programming and um, functional programming. And can anybody, just as a quick review, can you tell me what were some of the tools that were available if we were gonna use imperative programming? Does anybody remember? I, I don't remember. There were two tools. So there was the for loop and then the, the while. Loop, the while loop. Yep. So then there was those two, there was those two kind of uh, tools that we could use with an imperative programming. And then functional programming, which was the per package, which were the map, the map to the P map, which we were starting to kind of talk about last time. And so just to kind of reiterate and give an example again of where we're at, here's kind of the difference of difference between imperative and functional programming using a uh, for loop and then using a map function. So here's our kind of basic goal that we were trying to do last time where we were trying to use the MT cars data set and we were trying to calculate the mean for every single column. This is one approach that we could have taken where we are very, being re very repetitive and doing a lot of copy and pasting. We get all that data right there, we get our answer, but there's a more elegant way to do it so the first way was looking at uh, imperative programming. So using a for loop to go through and, and go through each column and calculate it and output a specific vector. Now we talked about some of the issues or some of the disadvantages of going through this. Can anybody tell me as a quick review, what was some of the disadvantages for doing this using a for loop? Multi. Yeah, exactly. What else? What are some other things? Am I remembering like the, the output format? Um, you can't specify, well, I guess maybe you can if you do a vector, the way you specify the output. Like here you have it as a vector double, but I guess if you wanted something different, you could just make it something different. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing with the, with the output, we have to specify an output object. Like we have to initialize an output object before we can run the for loop. Anything else? The other thing is that we had to do some bookkeeping, right? Like we have to kind of keep in mind, okay, well, we have to do the output. Then we have to tell it how we want to iterate and what we want to iterate over. And then we have to specify the specific function that we want to do that we want to do through the object that we're trying to iterate over. So it's a little bit more bookkeeping-ish. But then we talked a little bit about functional programming, getting into the map functions. And basically everything that we've done in both of these examples, we can kind of condense down into doing a map function. And so it could be as simple as just kind of setting a specific function here, which we'll talk a little bit more about anonymous functions. But we can just do the same kind of output here and getting it outputted in a list. But then we also could have been able to use a map underscore DF function to actually output a data frame. And so the map package allows us many different kind of functions that allow us to modify the output without having to specify 
that specific output at the start. And so, um, again, it, it's a little bit more elegant with this. It's a little bit more kind of condensed. Uh, you also got to remember that there was one disadvantage that we talked about as well is that um, it's, uh, excuse me, there, oh, we have to know what the functions do. And then also remember that not all map functions are going to solve all of our iteration problems. So there are times that you may have to require the use of a for loop or a while loop. Um, and map is not always going to solve those problems. So uh, we kind of talked about those things. It allows us to break up complex tests for using pipes. It provides us several functions to kind of do this basic structure, loop over a vector, do something to each element, and then save the results at the end. And I referenced this good blog series. Uh, I, won't, I won't pop it up again, but it's linked in the notes, but there's a good blog series with like six or seven different blogs about the practical applications of the per package and map functions and, and all the, all kinds of stuff with it. So if you have the chance, go look at it. It's, it's, it's a good series. So we were talking about the different functions. We talked about how um, these prefixes um, at the end, they just kind of change the output of our map function. So the per package allows us many different types of outputs. So if we wanted to output a logical vector, we could use underscore LGL. If we wanted to do int, int, so on and so forth. But kind of the base foundation one was map, which always outputs a list object. So that's available to you. And again, it takes that basic, takes a vector as an input, applies a function to each piece, and then returns it to the same length. We talked about that, that it was closely related to those base functions like L apply, S apply, and V apply. And I self-disclosed to you that I really have never used those functions. But if you're somebody who is more of a base R person coming into the tidyverse, these are very similar functions to what these do. So, and then we talked about the examples. So there was this discussion in this book between this idea of for loops versus per functions. And so there was this little discussion about it. And I, I tried to find kind of the source of it and maybe somebody could shed some light on it. But there was, there's been this discussion for the longest time where people would say, don't use a for loop, it's slow. Don't use a for loop because it's slow. And in this book, Hadley and the other, uh, the other author basically say this. Some people will tell you to avoid for loops because they are slow. They're wrong, explanation point. Well, at least they're rather out of date as for loops haven't been slow for many years. Now, I don't know if anybody can shine light on this one for me, but this was a discussion that somebody that, that was discussed about a while ago. And I've seen it a couple of times, especially within Stack Overflow. But I don't know. Does anybody have like an opinion on this or any insight into why there's this debate between a for loop and functional programming? No, I, 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 like I said, I've come across some of it in like Stack Overflow posts where people say it, but according to the book now, it's okay to use a for loop, you know, solve the problem for, uh, you know, it's okay to use that for loop. What you can do is you can use that for loop to try and solve your problem first, then see if you can apply it into a map function if you want to. So according to the book, it's okay. I'm not really sure where that debate started or why it's there, but if somebody can give me some insight on that, that would be great. The other thing about using kind of the map functions and using functional programming to do iteration is the benefit is not necessarily the speed, but the clarity. It's easier to read and write, and it focuses on the operation being performed, not the bookkeeping of a for loop. So again, when we look at this, we're basically focused on what's the function, what's the action that we're trying to do. In our case here, our function is we just want to calculate a mean. Now, you can make this more complicated. You could pipe this to other things to do. You could pipe this to do other things within here, like in the case up here where I'm trying to take our output and change it as, as dot character. But you can continue to chain your pipe within this function. And so you're mainly focused on what's the action that you're trying to perform. When you go back up to the for loop, you're concerned about three things. You're first concerned about specifying the output then you're specifying what you want to iterate and how you want to iterate over it. And then you're, then you're looking at the actual function itself. So the benefit of functional programming is it's easier to read, to see what you're trying to do. 
and your focus is on what you're trying to do. So does anybody have any questions about the differences or the benefits or the disadvantages between imperative programming and functional programming? Uh, not for now. I'm sure there's a, well, books have been written on the, on the differences, uh, but for me, I, I think I've got it as much as I need to know on it. Hopefully. <laughs> At least enough for us to do a little bit of data science. So, yeah, right. um, so the book also talks about some of these shortcuts that you can use. Uh, the, basically with PER, when you're trying to specify the specific function that you're doing, you have kind of two yeah. options. You can either specify an anonymous function or the shortcut is a one-sided formula. So if you look at kind of a map function at its foundation, it, it, it requires at least two inputs, your dot X and your dot F. Now the dot X and the dot F, when you first see this, you're like, what does this mean? It's not even that clear. So what I tried to do is I tried to express um, kind of in a general term, what these things will do or what you need to specify. Within the map function, the dot X is usually the list or the vector or the object that you want to iterate over. Now I put list in here, but it could be basically anything. Again, it could be a vector, it could be a tibble. Um, it's just the objects that you want to iterate over. And then the dot F is the function that you want applied to each object that you're iterating over. And so with our example, again, going back to this, just kind of our general example here, what we're trying to do is we're taking empty cars, which each object within that list is, or each object within that tibble is the columns. And what we're trying to do is we're just calculating with the formula of the mean dot X. So, and then with the dot, 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 if you have a specific function that you're, or if you're using like a specific function, this dot, dot, dot allows you to specify any other arguments that your functions may call upon to use as well. But really when it comes down to the map functions, just think of it as what's the list, what's the object that you want to iterate over, and then what's the function that you want to apply to it. Now what's nice about this is that the dot F argument in the per function or in these per functions allow you to specify it in two ways. The first one is you can use an anonymous function, which is this. And anytime that you hear an anonymous function, just think of it as a function with no name. Because when we specify a function, we generally have to use the assignment operator to give it a name. In our case, because we're using it in the map function and specifying it as the dot F, we don't have to give it a name and we're not giving it a name. And so um, I don't know if anybody remembers like Game of Thrones. Uh, I always remember, uh, do I have any Game of Thrones fans or Game, Game of Thrones fans here? Yeah, so one of my favorite is like the girl who has no name. That's what I think of, a, of as, as a function. <laughs> An anonymous function is a function that has no name. So I don't know if that helps, but uh, anytime, the first time I heard that, I was like, oh, okay, it's kind of like Game of Thrones. You know, again, a girl who has no name, uh, has no name. So looking at this though, can somebody tell me, I specified the dot F here, but where's the dot X? What is the dot X here? So, so right before that, you've got split. Yes, yeah, so you got empty cars and you've got split based off of the cylinders. So that gives you a couple of data frames in a list. Mm -hmm. And so then the map is going to take each of those data frames. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So looking at this and many of you who aren't familiar, familiar with modeling, which we'll get to next week, which we'll start talking about next week. Basically what we're doing is we're taking each one of those data sets and we're calculating a linear, a linear model looking at, uh, looking at the relationship between miles per gallon for the weight of the vehicle. And because we split it by cylinder, we're looking at that relationship for each cylinder. Again, if that's, if that's beyond anything, if that didn't make too much sense, we'll talk a little bit more about it. But actually, actually it's just because I, I presented the pipe and actually it's the meaning of the pipe to use, you know, to, to you. Yeah, exactly. It's it, actually, I got it now because I explained the pipe a few weeks ago. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. Um, but anyways, so looking at this, looking at that, we're using this function here. Can somebody tell me what's the, what's the output? What's the, what's the class of the output? What am I going to get as a, as this? And that might've been a murky question. So if I need to clarify, let me know. I think a list. Yeah, so it's going to be a list, right? Because we're we're mapping it, so it's going to be a list of all of our LM of all of our LM output that we have. So good. Um, but what's nice about this is instead of using an anonymous function, you can use a one-sided formula as a shortcut. And with our one-sided formula, and I don't know if you can see this because my slides are kind of taking are kind of going down to the bottom we can take this function df outside of it and just specify it with a tilde and then whatever we want to do and then pass pass along. Now the book talks about just using the dot and it should still work, but I don't know why you would use a dot and not use a dot x, but you can use a, excuse me, you can use a dot in this case and it still works. And basically it's just going to take, this is just kind of a placeholder for each data set to say, hey, put each data set here in this place here as it iterates through um, each object within that list. Okay. Any questions about the difference between anonymous functions and, and the use of the one-sided formula? I've got a couple. Yeah. Can you, do you have, do you already have this code in R? Yeah. Um, R real quick. Yeah, I have it in the slides. Um, let me pop it out here. So it's, this one is a shortcuts, right? Per functions, functions. So the shortcuts right here. <clears throat> so, um, so this, the function where you have on line two, uh, 284, where you have the function, um, that doesn't, oh, it does take the normal format of a function because you can, I was noticing that, that it didn't have the curly brackets, but that's because it's all on one line. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, you, you could, I think you can add the curly brackets yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. And it should still, this, I think the syntax should still work. Yeah. That, yeah, that makes sense. It just threw me off real quick because it didn't have, it didn't follow the same, full layout that I had that I was used to for the functions. So okay. So so and you don't have to specify anything about the first argument because that automatically goes in. So you just go right into function df map function df. Okay. And then it's a linear model. And then I haven't done linear models yet. So data uh, What's that part? Data equals df. So in the LM, uh, and, and when you use the LM function, you have to specify which data set you want to use. Mm -hmm. And in our case, because we're passing it through using an anonymous function, mm -hmm. we're specifying that the data would be df. And then so we have to specify df in the definition of the anonymous function. So basically it's just, it's just a placeholder. Well, it's not a placeholder, but data, L, data equals is an argument with an LM because you have to specify the data that you want to create your model from. Is that clear? Yeah. So, but um, so, so the, the DF actually represents the, the data frame itself. Cause I'm thinking the step before makes a list with mm -hmm. two or three or four data frame. Mm -hmm. So three data frames, okay. And then it, since it's a mat function, it's iterating over each one of those data frames. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, so it's almost like putting map data frame number one, and then the function to apply is that one. But how does it ever connect that the, the data that the data frame that you have in the first argument that's not there so like the, the dot x how does it ever connect that that df references the the dot x um let's see if i can ask it a different way so so the first the first time it goes through it picks a data frame the first data frame data frame number one right 
So even though it doesn't have a dot X in that map command, it's implied that that dot X is the first data frame. Yeah, I, I would say that. I mean, what's coming to me is, is I would want to say it's magic, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it just, it kind of knows. I mean, I'm just going to say it kind of knows that when you, if you specify it as an anonymous function, yeah. to be honest, I, I mean, I knew you could do it this way, but I haven't, you know, I yeah. haven't done it this way. I mean, what you could do is you could take this function out and define it outside of the map function. And then I think you could superimpose dot X into the function arg, you know, in the function argument. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say that um, the way I think about it is, is as if you had mean, like a fun any function, like mean there what you're doing is defining the function. So if you have main, like it's gonna think by default that whatever you give it is the first argument of the main function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know so it I mean? could, yeah, so it could be like lazy evaluation, right? Like it's 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 taking the argument by position, I guess is I, if, if I'm saying that right. Okay, it, yeah, it might just be needing to be familiar with the, um, the linear model linear model function anyway and, and that particularly that argument yeah it's okay okay so no big deal so i get that one um and then on the one-sided formula we you we you've replaced function df with the tilde and replace data equals with the with the dot or the dot x potentially yeah i, I think this should still work the book talks about having the dot but i I would assume that you would you could still put the dot x in it and it still yeah. works. Yeah. Okay. So all this is is just a shortcut for it is basically that I, you know, shortcut to yeah. write it to make it cleaner. So all it's saying is everything that comes after this tilde is the function. Yep. Okay. Pretty much. Cool. Maria, yeah. did I cut you off? I'm sorry if I did. Okay. Uh oh, well, go ahead. No, you did it. You did it. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. There's a, a Zoom. Zoom has those things where you're kind of like, did I cut somebody off today? Not. So if I do, just just jump in. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so okay, we got that nailed down. So those are anonymous functions, one-sided formulas. The other function, or the another thing that's out there, is being able to extract things from objects using um, named components. So you kind of have to kind of know what the output of LM is to kind of understand this, which we'll talk about next week. But there is an object that gets outputted with the LM function called R squared. And if you're familiar with linear models, um, you kind of understand what R squared is. But just general sense, all this is doing is there's two ways to pull these objects out. You can either do it with a... Uh, referencing it using a tilde dot name, or you can just use it as a string and then pull it out as well. So just looking at this generally as the shortcut itself, all we're doing is we're just pulling an object out of our LM output. So there's just two ways to do it. You can either do it the tilde with the one-sided with the one-sided formula, or you can just use um, just this kind of naming convention with the string. I just have a question. Do you use sometimes the dollar sign? Because you know, the dollar sign is base air. Is after, if you need just, in case you don't use it, uh, use it sometimes just to explore because you type the dollar and after you can see, especially when you have a list of list of lists, is the easiest way to, um, to find out what it is. You, uh, so use the dollar sign sometime. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so what I think it is, is it's it's going down a level. So if we just like look at this first one here, like, cause all this map does is it's just saying, hey, pull the summary object out of the LM output. And then, so from this, what we can do is then we can pull out just the specific R squared. Did that answer your question, Sandra? Yeah, yeah but you know, if now, if you take models with the dollar sign, we can see all the other elements we can uh, grab. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well, I mean, we could grab other elements out of it too. Um, I'm trying to think, I think coefficients is another one that you can pull. Right. Well, maybe not. No, it's just because you see double, I think so. 
I mean, I th I'm sure you could use like the double bracket subsetting like this too. So like R squared, R dot squared. Like you could do this. I think you can do this too. Yeah, it works the same. So you could do the double bracket notation to pull it too. Um, but, uh, for this, go ahead. Yes, uh, so for these functions, why is that you need a dot in front of the bracket? Because I think what it's doing is, is so what, what we have here is we have our model object, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think this is where this kind of example gets a little, um, gets a little murky because you really have to kind of understand how the LM option or the LM function works and what's the output is. Mm -hmm. But basically this is just a placeholder. So what we're doing is, is we're pulling. So what we're doing is we're iterating over to calculate from our model, we're pulling out the summary object. Mm -hmm. And so this is the summary object from it. But if we want to pull out the R squared value, then this just serves as a placeholder for each one of these. So like, Here's your first object, your second object, then oh, your I think third I, oh, object. Oh, I got it, I got it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. That, yeah, so it's, I, I, it's just like a placeholder. I mean, the yeah. dot, you could use the dot X, I think. I don't know why the book kind of switched back and forth between using a dot and a dot X. I thought that was a little confusing, but I've used dot, I use dot X because that's explicit in the map function. You know, you have dot X, dot F. So you should mm -hmm. reference it using dot X. Does that answer your question, Sky? Yes, yes, very good. Thank you. Okay. But I mean, you could you could skip this all together and you can use a string to pull out that object. Again, this is kind of a murky example from the book because you really have to kind of know what the output of LM is. And if you're not familiar with LM, it this is kind of a confusing example. But so so the same way that you can drill down from a list into a data frame into the column of a data frame, into an element of the column, you can also do that with the function as well, it sounds like. You go from summary and then a component of summary is R squared. Well, that's cool. Yeah, so you could, like, you could keep chaining this over and over again. So you could, have, you could keep chaining it with a pipe to drill down further and further into what you want to do, or you can do more operations on it. So if you wanted to calculate the sum of this R squared, what you could do is like map, uh, map double, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, you could pipe it into this and do like, I don't know if you would ever want to do this, but you could do dot X, I don't know, times 10, I don't know. Nope, maybe not. Oh, I have to do this. There you go, then you can times it by 10. So you could keep doing more operations on your objects as they get piped through. I don't know. That's cool. Yeah, I know. I when, Once you like see like the, the flexibility of map, you're like, this thing is like, it's probably one outside of Luberdate, this is probably like my favorite R package. Yeah, I was having like, I was having Luberdate flashbacks thinking about how cool all this stuff was. So yes, as a matter of fact. It's just super flexible. Like there's just so many things you can do with it, which is just crazy. Okay, cool. Uh, anything else on being able to extract like name components? So then the other thing you can do is you can do elements by position. Um, the, bo the book had a pretty good example of this. So when you look at this there, when you look at this, we have this X object. Inside this F X object, we have, a, we have lists within a list. So we have this first list here, we have the second list here, this third list here. So you can pull data by position. So if you look, if we do a map DBL by one, it will pull the first element. So we'll pull this element, it will pull this element, and then it will pull this element. If you do map DBL two, it's gonna pull this one, this one, and then this one. And then if it was three, it's gonna be three, six and nine. So I've never used this, but if you ever find yourself in a situation where you don't have named elements within your list and you want to extract them, you could extract it through position if you needed to. But I've never, I've never used this, but it's, it's available to you. So I don't know. Does anybody have any examples where they might use this or they have used it? Yeah, it was kind of one of those things where I was like, oh, that's cool. But 
I don't so, know if I'll use it. Go okay. ahead. No, go ahead. Well, if, if, yeah, if nobody really uses that, I guess it doesn't matter too much. But it's like, um, I, I'm surprised that map double with the one in parentheses doesn't just reference the first list of the list. Doesn't just reference one, two, three. It in fact yeah. references the first position of each of the lists. It, 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 makes, yeah, it makes sense because it's on the list. So the list is uh, one element. So it's a one of the one. Actually, what would have been interested is to know how to grab uh, the list, not, not by element, if we want to grab the second of a list. Yeah, so if you want to just grab this, like, the, yeah. like this vector here, this list, well, then that's where subsetting would come in, right? Like if you wanted yeah. to pull that yeah. second object, then you would have to do like X uh, double bracket. Okay. Right, four, five, six. Yeah, so it's like I, I, the difference between double brackets and parentheses. So now we have single brackets, double brackets, and parentheses, and they all do something different. Okay, <laughs> don't get confused, anybody. Yeah, I'm trying not to. I mean, sometimes you just gotta. Sometimes I've I've caught myself doing the. Uh, does this work? Right. Maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe I'll do this one. You know, so a little trial and error. Um. Anyways. I, I mean, I, 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 sh I shouldn't mischaracterize this. Like I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say that nobody uses this. There's, there's probably somebody, there's probably a use case for it, but I, for myself, I've just never come across a use case of where I could use it, but, um, but now, you know, uh, so let's talk about dealing with failure. So, um, one, one thing that you'll kind of come across is if you start iterating over things, especially if you have things where, they're going to be like a long running computation or a long running process. Your operations are more than likely possibly going to fail. And, um, you know, you want to capture the data from your iteration. So a good example of this, and I'll show you, I'll show kind of a graphic here in a second, but one thing that I come across with this a lot is using APIs. So application programming interfaces, basically to put an API or to define an API generally is it's just like a gateway that you can use to access data. But some of these APIs that you use are super, super slow and you have to make a lot of requests to get your data. And so to give you an example, there's an API that I work with that it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to get all the data that I need. And so there's situations where I may have to iterate a process and if it takes 20, 30 minutes and then it goes through and it's like, oh, fail, error. If you're 20 to 22 minutes into the process, you're like, oh, well, I wish I could have those 22 minutes of my life back. And the worst part is you don't know what happened. And so I kind of put this little graphic together of, <clears throat> of dealing with failure through the use of adverbs, which we'll talk about here in a second. But here's kind of like the basic process if you don't use an adverb for a long running process. I'm just using APIs for this example because this is something that I use APIs for. But say you have a long running computation that you're doing. Say you're working with big data and you have a long running computation that takes a few hours, days, whatever it may be. Uh, if you don't use an adverb like safely or possibly, what could happen is, is you run this big process for a long time, run, R runs through it, it runs into an error and stops running after two hours. You're going to be the sad person right here. Don't be the sad person. Use an adverb, especially if you are, um, especially if you're doing like a long running process that employs like iteration. But if you're somebody that imply or uses one of these adverbs, again, long running process, long running computation. If you use an adverb, it won't fail. But what it will do is in your output, it will give you all of the errors and continue throughout the iteration. So if you run into an error, you could be like this person that has an idea to look at your output and say, huh, I wonder what, what, what went wrong with my process. Then you go back to it, you reevaluate your code, and then you're this happy person right here. So don't be this person. Be this person. Use an adverb. Again, I use API or interacting with APIs for the example, but just place any long running process in this as well. So what are some of these tools that we can use to deal with failure? 
uh, it really comes down to asking the question of how can we capture the successes even in cases of failure? So even if our process fails, can we still get data returned to inform us when those failures happened and why they happened? The other thing is, is how can we identify all the errors in our process? Because what happens is, say you have this process that takes a long time, you run into your first error, you don't necessarily know that there's going to be future errors along in the process. So yeah, you might have that one error that happens after 30 minutes, you fix that error, you run your process, then it goes to 45, you run into your next error. Oh, wait, I got to go back and fix that. 45 minutes pass, another error. So you kind of see, it kind of compounds. So what you really need to think about when you think about these tools is trying to find ways to get something returned so you can figure out what are those errors and how to fix them. So the per function actually has three of these adverbs that you can use to finish the process and return something to you. The first one is safely. Uh, it's the adverb that, and again, it's an adverb. Basically, it's called an adverb because it modifies the function, the verb. When it comes to safely, safely never returns an error. It's only going to return a list with two elements. It's going to return the result element and it's going to return the error element. Possibly, uh, you provide what the output's going to be in the case of failure. Quietly, um, captures printed output like messages and warnings. And so I'll share an example here since we kind of talked through it. <clears throat> but uh, we kind of talked through these examples. Oh, these are the slides, excuse me. So let me get back to the examples. While I get the examples up, does anybody have any questions about the adverbs before we go through some of the examples? <clears throat> okay. So let's kind of work through what safely does here. So let's just say I have this list, we'll call it object X. We have a string value B, we have a numeric value one, 10 and A. And then what we're gonna try and do is we're gonna do a map function, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the log of each of these. And so I'm not a mathematician, but I can kind of basically understand that if I try and take a log of a string value, it's not gonna work, it's gonna throw an error. So what's gonna happen is, is if I run through this process, it should error out right here and it should error out right here. So if I run this, using safely, what it's gonna do is it won't error out, but it's going to output my errors in the list as the output. So if I run this and look at the structure, what you're gonna see is, is that within each list element, I get a result and then I get the error output. Second object, I get the result and then I get an error object, so on and so forth. If this doesn't, if this kind of structure is, is hard to see, let's just do a quick view. Let me, if you look at it through like the view, what you'll see in each iteration that we did, the output gives me a result and then it gives me the error output, it gives me the result gives me the result, gives the result and error output. So if there is an error, there's gonna be something in the error section of the list. If there's a result, it's gonna be in the result. So safely is kind of nice because it does that. There is another thing that you, another function, say everything works out well for you through your process and you wanna just take out all of the errors, you can use this transpose function to kind of separate them into all results, all errors. So then you can just take all, all, all errors and just have just results. So um, if you have any long computation or a long running process, safely use your friend. <laughs> uh, use it. It helps out a lot. So does anybody have any questions about the use of safely? Has anybody used safely before? Or is this the first time that people have been introduced to it? First time. First time. I first time that I like first time that I like had a long running process that I had an error and I was like, uh, I have no idea what happened. I learned about safely and it 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 changed. It changed uh, how how I kind of did map functions, but possibly is another adverb. Um, but all possibly does is it it allows you to specify what the output is going to be in cases of failure. 
So let's go back to our example list. We have a string value, two numerics and a string value. If we try and pass this through, it's gonna fail again at this. But what I can do is I can specify what I want the output to be in cases of failure. So in my case here, it's gonna iterate over this list object. And because I did the NA real, any time in failure, it's gonna replace it with that NA value. And you can specify this, whatever you want it to be. I think I can even specify it as like a string value. I think failure. Nope, can't do it. I have to use an NA value. So NA real. Okay. Any questions about the use of possibly? I've never used, I honestly never use possibly, but I don't use it as often as I do safely. But if you're working with a lot of vectors, it's a good option for you. Um, quietly is different. Uh, quietly allows you to capture the printed output, like the messages and the warnings. I thought this one was kind of nice. If you were just looking for it to capture um, like what warnings or whatever you have in your list. So what this is doing is it's just, um, it's just capturing those, like the result output, the output itself, the warnings and the messages. So basically I look at quietly as being a function that you could get more information on what's going on, but I haven't really used quietly too much. Again, I, I've used more of um, uh, uh, safely more. Does anybody have any questions about quietly? Use those adverbs, uh, use those adverbs. Again, going back to my example, don't be the sad person, be the happy person. Uh, use those adverbs. So what's nice about this is we also have the opportunity to map over multiple arguments. So at times we need to have more inputs into our map functions. And so what's nice about per is it provides two functions to help us iterate over multiple objects in parallel. In our case, we have map two and we have pmap. Map two is nice because it can take two inputs, a dot X and a dot Y and our dot F, which is our function, and then our pmap. And the reason why we have a pmap, the book talks about it, it would be kind of, um, I don't say ridiculous, but it'd be kind of too much if you had like a map two, map three, map four, map five, six, seven. It's not very flexible for all your uses. So pmap allows you to have as many inputs as you could imagine. So a good example of this would be um, using map. So say right here, all I'm gonna use this map function for is to create a bunch of plots. So I created a bunch of plots using empty cars, looking at the relationship between each variable and MPG. But these aren't very informative because my X variable that I have on my X and Y, it's just gonna be dot X for every single one. So if I wanted to use a second input, I could use a map two to input the names of this variable to superimpose it there. And that's where map two comes into play. So here what I'm doing is I'm capturing all the names within MT cars. So MPG cylinder disp HP. And I'm doing the same thing, but now what I'm doing is I'm using that names object into this function here to label my x-axis. So now I have two inputs in it. So if I run this, now what I have is for each plot, I have my x-axis labeled. So that's just a way to kind of add a second input. And your second input could be anything. The big thing to notice here is, is that with map two, you have your dot x and then your dot y and then you superimpose it within it, each one. So dot x, dot y. Does anybody have any questions about uh, map two? I know I'm kind of cruising through it. So, um, but let's say I wanted to add like a third variable to it. And I'm going to tell, I'm going to say that my mental model of PMAP kind of changed after reading this chapter because I thought I knew what PMAP does until I read this chapter. And then I was like, maybe I don't really know what PMAP does. So I kind of created this quick example, thinking about if I wanted to add like a third element, 
let's just say I wanted to look at a third variable and add a custom title. And so what I did here is I create a list of all of my arguments. So my X variable will be my names, empty cars. I'm gonna add a bubble. So I'm gonna add the size of the points to change. And then just to make my plots a little more informative, I'm just gonna add a title. So here's a list of all the elements that I'm gonna to use to use PMAP over. So X var, bubble var, and then our titles. I define the function outside of PMAP that I wanna use. So I'm gonna iterate all of these objects in parallel inside of this function here. Again, X var, bubble var, title. Run this. If I run this with empty cars and look at empty cars plot, now what I should have is I should have every single plot with a title and a bubble or the size of the plot changing and then all my X axis label as well. Now, I know I just went over PMAP in like two minutes, but basically just 50,000 foot view of PMAP it allows you the flexibility to have as many inputs as you want inside of your map function is basically all it does. I'm sure I'm gonna have questions about the PMAP. So what questions can I answer about PMAP? The only, the only thing I noticed on it is that map two seems to use dot X and dot Y and then PMAP uses the actual names like you make the actual names. Yeah, that's, that's the way. Well, that's how it's flexible, right? Instead of having like a map three, map four, map five, what you're doing is you're specifying the actual function itself yeah. and then using those names inside of the function to which then you, those yeah. get, pro, those get processed in parallel. Yeah, makes sense. So this is super flexible. Like I, I still don't think I truly understand the power and flexibility of PMAP but it's, it's available. So, um, but yeah, it's available to you. I use it a lot for plotting, especially if I have like a lot of exploratory plots, it's great for that. Yeah. Let's see. Um, where am I at walk? Yeah. We're kind of at the 55 mark. I only have like two more concepts to talk about, but I think we could probably table them and then pick up Take a little bit at the start next time. Yeah. Finish yeah, this up. Yeah, let's do that. And then um, you, uh, we can also uh, maybe start the next chapter as well, which is modeling basics. So it's uh, there's like an introductory chapter, and then that's chapter 22, and then chapter 23 is model basics. Um, so I haven't gotten into these chapters myself yet, so I don't know how much content there really is in there, but. Um, maybe we'll just maybe do chapter 22 and chapter three, uh, chapter 22 and chapter 23 next week after you finish up with what you've got here, Colin. Does that work? I, I think I got about 10, yeah. 10 to 12 minutes left, to be honest. Cool. You no, know, I say that I would present mod, uh, the chapter about models that is something I can do. It's sure. just that I have more an issue about the fact that um, it is, if it's code, it's fine, but if it's modeling, it's not fine, you know? Yeah. It's the issue. So let's say that let uh, let take the paradigm that we are not going to talk about model, but more about coding. Yeah. I believe that it will be easier for anyone. So we won't have a modeling question because I don't agree with the book on this part. You know, it's okay. great. However you want to do it, it will be fine. It'll be a it'll be a valuable discussion no matter what. I'm sure. So okay, that will be great then. So Sandra, you'll handle your column will finish, and then Sandra will finish, will do the 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 beginning of those modeling chapters. And then we'll plan on finishing through chapter 23 next week, and then we'll um, figure out where to go from there, chapter 24 and so on. Um, the other thing that I was gonna just ask at the end here, I want, I'm curious how much experience everybody has with map. Like if you rate yourself on a scale from one to 10, um, 10, like one being brand new and 10 being an expert and don't be modest. I'm curious where everybody puts themselves. I put myself at maybe a two or a three because I'm just now getting familiar with it. Uh, let's say that six months ago, I had to do something for work 
And at this time, I was six. Now that my code is working, uh, I'm not even able to remember what I did. So now <laughs> I go back to two, but anyway, I have something I can press a button. So it's exactly what you shouldn't do because I didn't comment enough for myself, yeah. but now I have my powerful code to populate all my plot in PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And it's all I needed to do. So after now, I don't need to use it again. So I believe that the issue with this kind of stuff is when you do for some time, it could be good. Then after it's very easy to forget. Yeah, okay. So Sandra went from a six to a two. Okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I would say seven. I think I'm really good with it, with the stuff that I have to do. Yeah. But then if you want me to like apply them to like, like general problems, like I said, with PMAP, I was like my entire mental model changed once I read this chapter. So I'd say a seven. Cool. Sky or Maria? Me, I, no, I just, I just get exposed to these functions when I start to read this data, data, uh, alpha data science. Yeah. So it's, it's about like a two or three months ago, I started to read about it. And I, I was just shocked about how this work because yeah. it's so efficient and the need. Yeah. But before this, I always just use like for loop, while loop to do. Okay. Iteration. Good. Maria, yeah. you, you sound like you might have some experience with it. Mm, I mean, I have some experience with it. I have done some tutorials more. We did, but you know what happens? I think that sometimes I'm, it's a, it's a bad practice, but I'm in a rush to finish things. And I know I could use, you know, I could use map. I should use map, mm -hmm. but because I'm such in a rush, I have the bad habit of sometimes not using it, even though I know it will be valuable. Yeah. So, so that's why I say four or five, like I have used it for some things, but definitely, could use it more and it's something that that i think where i struggle is is with list columns mm -hmm. using it for list columns i know that that that's something where i could use it but haven't done it so much yeah yeah i yeah. i came across oh go ahead Sam. Yeah. you know and it's not uh in the i don't think in the book but i never under i have never understood the nested table so yeah. Yeah, those, yeah, no. Nested well, tables, no. Well, we'll get to those, right? <laughs> After we finish the book, we'll push on to some of these other harder topics. But that's good. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you say that, Maria, because I, I know we spend sometimes, you spend uh, like 20 hours to save yourself five minutes, 20 hours figuring out how to do something to save yourself five minutes. But you know, it's all part of learning process. Well, that, that's that's good. Um, I'm encouraged that we're all still kind of learning it and, and getting some practice with it. Um, we're we're over time, so I guess we can end it here. But I, I wanted to say thank you to Colin and really to everybody for your participation, your questions, and um, we'll look forward to picking it up again next week. And in the meantime, let's keep in touch on the chat or whatever it might be. So, you guys have a great week, and we will Everyone, talk to you later. Bye. Have a bye. good rest of your week. Okay, thank you. See ya. Bye.